This micro lecture is on renewable energy and fuel policy. Similar but different than the SPR, the U.S. also has a National Petroleum Reserve, or NPR, that would be good to read up on. The National Petroleum Reserve was established in 1912 as a backup source of crude oil for the federal government. Originally meant for the Navy as it converted from coal to oil, it is still often referred to as the Naval Petroleum Reserve. Four sites in the country originally comprised the Naval Petroleum Reserve. Naval Petroleum Reserves numbers 1 and 2 were in California. Number 3 was near Casper, Wyoming, and number 4 was in Alaska and also known as NPRA, or Naval Petroleum Reserve, Alaska. The only NPR still under government control is NPRA, and it is controlled by the Department of the Interior, not the Department of Defense. Unfortunately, an assessment by the USGS in 2010 estimated that the amount of oil yet to be discovered in the NPRA is only one-tenth of what was believed to once be there based on a previous assessment completed in 2002. The 2010 USGS assessment says the NPRA contains approximately 896 million barrels of oil. The reason for the decrease is because of new exploratory drilling, which showed that many areas that were believed to hold oil actually held gas. Please take a moment to review this week's learning objectives. Despite the challenges, blending of ethanol and gasoline continues to be practiced in the U.S. and will likely continue to become a larger part of our fuels infrastructure. There is a lot of rationale behind this approach, which is why it is part of our biofuel policy and our strategic development in the domestic energy industry. Currently, the biofuel policy in the U.S. is complicated, so we will not have time to review all of it in detail. However, we will review many of the policies and developments at a high level so that they make more sense when you hear them in the media. We will cover the government's mandates on bioenergy production and use, the tax breaks to encourage the use of biofuels, and the monetary support in biofuel R&D through tax breaks and direct spending. Government investment in biofuels also encourages more private investment in this area. The most important policy with respect to biofuel in the United States is the Renewable Fuel Standard, known as the RFS. It was first introduced in 2005 and first published in 2007. RFS outlines the production and consumption targets for biofuels in the U.S. Blending ethanol with gasoline is also part of the mandate in RFS. The program was created under the Energy Policy Act of 2005, and the EPA is responsible for making annual standards for the program. The original RFS was under revision since 2007, and a new standard was published in 2010, known as RFS-2. RFS-2 addressed some concerns about the use of corn ethanol, specifically the CO2 emission during the biofuel production process. Using minimum greenhouse gas emissions as part of the definition for renewable fuels is very important so that we are able to make sure that the biofuels we are producing are contributing to a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Long-term goals for biofuel production and use were also outlined in RFS2, and the new standards added new definitions of biomass feedstocks as well as renewable bioenergy. RFS2 includes biodiesel, biomass-derived renewable diesel, as well as new rules on feedstock and land use. Additional pathways were introduced to RFS2 in July 2014. These included compressed natural gas and liquefied natural gas produced from biogas, as well as electricity produced from biogas that is used to power vehicles. Some renewable biomass types in RFS2 are planted crops and crop residues, planted trees and tree residues, animal waste material and animal byproducts, logging slash and pre-commercial thinnings, urban biomass and wildfire thinnings, algae, and separated yard waste or food waste. Alternative fuels were defined in the Energy Policy Act of 1992. Please take a moment to review them. It is likely this list will continue to grow as our transportation technology continues to advance. The most important acronyms in the RFS 
our EPA for Environmental Protection Agency, and RIN, or RIN, meaning Renewable Identification Number, used for tracking batches of renewable transportation fuels. The blend wall is a term used to describe the limit of ethanol content in gasoline. Current RFS mandates that gasoline should be sold with the 10% volume of ethanol blended into the fuel. This 10% blend is known as E10, and a 15% blend is known as E15. All of the light-duty vehicles manufactured after 2007 can run on E15. Therefore, the transition from E10 to E15 should happen in the near future. RFS2 also includes guidelines for biodiesel consumption and specific targets through the next decade. Discussions about RINs are very common in bioenergy media coverage because they are associated with subsidies that support the production of biofuels. Renewable identification numbers, RINs, and renewable volume obligations, RVOs, are the mechanisms the EPA uses to implement the RFS program. RVOs are the requirement each refiner or importer of petroleum fuels must meet, while RINs allow for flexibility in how each of them may choose to comply. Basically, the manufacturing and distribution of biofuel is tracked using the RIN, and then these RINs are sold to people that have RVOs. The life cycle of RINs gets confusing, so let's look at it closer. RINs are generated from the production of renewable fuels. The EPA distributes RVOs to obligated parties who are required to submit RINs for RFS compliance. Businesses that produce products with RVOs must buy RINs from businesses that produce products with RINs. Businesses obligated in meeting the volumetric mandates for renewable fuels are businesses like oil companies, fuel blenders, and gasoline or diesel retailers. They must buy RINs from businesses like ethanol and biodiesel producers. RVOs can be met by purchasing RINs that have been physically separated from the renewable fuel and submitting the RINs to the EPA. They can also be met by purchasing and blending renewable fuels into fossil fuels. Futures of RINs are being traded in the categories of ethanol, advanced biofuel, and biodiesel. An obligated party could purchase RINs and submit them to the EPA to meet their RVOs instead of blending the fuel. The RIN trading provides an economic incentive for blending because the supply and demand for RINs in light of RFS mandates make them most economical this way. Carbon credits are probably in the future. The bottom line is, it doesn't matter what you burn, you are releasing carbon dioxide. Whether you burn coal, gas, or biomass, you are still burning stuff, and as a result, the most fair way to regulate emissions resulting largely from burning is a carbon tax. People that grow biomass should be able to sell carbon credits, and people that burn carbon should have to buy carbon credits. People that grow biomass should be able to sell carbon credits, and people that burn carbon should have to buy carbon credits. This avoids a mess of complicated and subjective methods of deciding whose carbon is worth what to who. As climate change begins to get more interesting, and the logic of carbon credits sets in, this is probably something we will see in the future, and burning biofuels will require purchasing carbon credits just like burning coal. Tax breaks are also an important component of the biofuel policy in the U.S., as they affect how economically competitive the biofuels are. The volumetric ethanol excise tax credit was a $0.45 cent per gallon tax credit for fuel blenders. The import duty for fuel ethanol was a $0.54 cent per gallon tariff on imported ethanol, and the small ethanol producer tax credit was a $0.10 cent per gallon credit to small ethanol producers. These are just a few examples. Some current biofuel incentives are listed here. The Airport Zero Emission Vehicle and Infrastructure Incentive is meant to cover 50% of the cost of any installed ZEV or Zero Emission Vehicle technology. 
The alternative fuel tax exemption states that non-taxable use of fuel is exempt from federal fuel tax, which includes farming, school buses, and other non-profit or educational uses. The fuel cell motor vehicle tax credit is available for the purchase of qualified light-duty fuel cell vehicles. Likewise, the hydrogen fuel tax credit is a tax credit for the purchase of hydrogen-fueled vehicles. These are some sources for bioenergy grants. These are important because federal funding encourages investments in the private sector. Bioenergy gets a disproportionate level of attention in the media and in politics. Some believe this is because it is finally starting to achieve some legitimacy, and some believe this is because it is a mistake. The available data would suggest that bioenergy gets more attention than it deserves. Bioenergy is growing, and it is accepting help to grow, but fossil fuels needed that as well and have continued to enjoy it for the better part of a hundred years. Oil pipeline and oil refining technology would not be as advanced as it is today if not for considerable government investment in the research and infrastructure that was necessary. Considering the U.S. fuel paradigm that we have learned about, it is surprising that increasing the supply of domestic fuel comes under such attack at times. We get really excited about fuel. These are traders at work in the crude oil futures pit at the New York Mercantile Exchange.